Hey guys, from Mike here with at uh, Waxhaw, and uh, we just been trying to get things improved and better. At least we got the computers working right today, and uh, just want to start by letting you know updates, if you will, on Brother Whalen. Uh, he is in the hospital, and he is having symptoms, kind of like. Uh, uh, I guess you'd say a pneumonia type sickness. They're running some of the new COVID-19 medicines through him. He's going to be in there for a couple of days. And so if you would keep him and Roxy in your prayers, this whole thing is about to stress her out, she said. And so if you would keep both Quayla and Roxy in there. Also saw Matt now for the day. Uh, they're doing better. They're still coughing some too. But they think theirs is just predominantly allergy related. And so we we'll keep them in your prayers. Saw Brother Ray, he's good. Uh, just a, you know, a friend of mine I grew up with named uh, Flint Smith is in with it, with this uh, virus. And he's got double pneumonia in ICU. If you think about it, just mention him. His name is Flint. And mention him in prayer, if you would. Um, a lot of things going around, folks. The fact is, it may be a little worse before it gets better. It may get, uh, they're talking about it peaking now, maybe mid-April. Uh, we really just don't know. And so just keep everyone around you in prayers. We're trying to, tell you what we're trying to do here at the church is we're trying to stay in touch. We're calling a lot of our folks, see if they're doing okay, see if they need anything. Just want you to know if you need anything, call the church. If you don't remember the number, it's 387-6372. Call the church. Let us know how we can help you. If you need us to go pick up some medicine or pick up some food for you, uh, don't do without. I know most of you got somebody helping you with that. But uh, you you be sure to let us know if you don't have help so we can help you. Um, other things, we're trying to stay in touch with new ways. Uh, we're getting our internet speed doubled here at the church tomorrow. And uh, that's going to make it easier for us to live stream our, our program, our ministry. And so hopefully this Sunday, if we have it done, we're not sure if we'll have everything by the end, but uh, might be able to do some live streaming where you could go to either the church website, which is washitabaptist.org. It's all one word, washitabaptist.org. And see it live streaming there. Uh, or you could go to our Facebook page, Watch Our Baptist Church Facebook page, and watch it live streaming there. Uh, it will be live streaming on the Facebook page for sure Sunday morning, and we'll make sure that you get to see that. Uh, both will have Sunday school at 945 and worship at 1045. So we are just trying to stay alert. Pray for those of us that are healthy, that we stay healthy. <laughs> and... Uh, and we do care about what's going on in your life. If we can pray for you, if there's some way we can pray special for you, please let us know that. And we do want to do that. In the midst of all of this talking about prayer, we want you to know the prayer list, even though we're not really passing that out right now or doing, keeping, trying to keep it updated. It's just too hard to do that with everybody but, and get it to you. But let us know. Call us if you have someone you'd like to add on the prayer list. Uh, we'll make sure we get that information out in some way. At least if it's a serious need like we did with Brother Wayland last night, we'll send it out to as many of you as we can. We'll either send text messages or emails. So we are trying to stay in contact, uh, but we need your help to do that. So keep us informed of what's going on in your life. Today I want to talk about the subject of living above the world. And I got that idea from, from Enoch in the book of Genesis. Enoch was one of the two people that we know was raptured or taken away. He and Elijah, the prophet, and uh, these two guys, both of them prophets really, were, were taken by God while still alive. The only two people in the Bible that we know of taken while still alive to go be with the Lord. That's why I believe they're the two witnesses that come back in the story in Revelation uh, those two witnesses that come back and the power of God is upon them and then they die in the streets because the Bible says it's appointed unto every man to die and then to judgment and they haven't died yet. So I really believe they'll be the two that come back and as witnesses and that die in the tribulation period 
And so some people say it could be Moses or someone else, but uh, uh, whoever it may be, at least those would be two good candidates for that. Uh, living above the world, that's kind of what we got to do right now. You know, the world is frantic. The world is, I want to tell you, that people who don't have Christ are just a nervous wreck right now uh, because their life is unprotected. Their future is bad. It's not good if they die without Christ. And so they're really uptight right now. And uh, Enoch was a man that lived in a pretty tough time. People don't think about the book of Genesis as being tough times. It was so bad, God destroyed the world. And he lived in a tough time. And I want to talk to you tonight about kind of what God did through this man named Enoch. And I hope it will be encouraging to you, okay? Let's go Lord in prayer as we start. Father, thank you that tonight we can just come together and uh, study the Word of God together. I pray, God, that you would speak tonight to the hearts of your people by your Holy Spirit. And, God, that you would just uh, take this time. And Father, may it encourage our church members. May it be a blessing to them. I pray for healing for those that are sick, like Brother Waylon and Miss Roxy and Matt and Alta and any others, Lord. Uh, Brother Flint Smith, a good friend of mine. Father, just I lift these folks before you for you to be the great physician in their lives. We ask you to do that in Jesus' name, God. And even as we as we study together and as we learn not to worry or to fret, but God, just to to trust you through all of these trying times. God, I just pray that you'll help people to relax and rest in Christ and God to let you have your way and let you bring some good out of this because you promised us that nothing will happen. If we'll just submit to you, nothing will happen, God, that you can't bring some good out of it. So God, we don't know what's beautiful and good that you're going to bring out of this, but we're just looking forward to it. I'm asking God for a renewal and a revival in our land. God, that you would just break forth and God, that people would get on their faces before you and get right and repent because of their sin. And God, that as a nation, we might once again be a blessing to you. So God, speak to, to us tonight. Help us, Lord, to learn from this great story about this man named Enoch. And we'll give you praise and glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to read to you from Genesis chapter 5 to begin tonight in verse 21 Genesis 5 21 Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah and after he begot Methuselah Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters so all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him now Methuselah lived 187 years and he begot Lamech. And he begot Lamech, and after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. And so all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. He was the oldest person recorded in the Bible to have lived. Now Lamech lived 182 years and had a son and he called his name Noah saying this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Wow, right up front. Names meant a lot back in those days. A Hebrew name really, it's almost like it was divinely given because it was it told us something about the expectation of the parents for the child. It told us something about their living conditions. It told us something about what they expected to happen in the future. It told us something about, about this child that they believed the impact that that child would have on the world. Uh, you're going to see tonight, in fact, if you go back, and I don't dwell on it a lot, but you see there Noah, the, the very name Noah means one who would comfort us concerning our work. And uh, man, when we think about that, all of these names of, uh, of, of Enoch's lineage, by the way, Enoch goes back to where? Adam, doesn't he? In fact, the Bible tells us that he was the seventh from Adam. Now, Adam had two lines. You remember in the beginning, he had Adam, I mean, I mean he had Cain and Abel, and Cain killed Abel, so it kind of wiped out Abel's lineage 
So that left Cain's lineage, his descendants, and then you had another child born to Adam and Eve called Seth. And Seth was, was going to be the beginning of this godly line. And uh, so you had the Cain's line was an ungodly line, and Seth's line was a godly line. In fact, if you study the names, and I just gave you Noah and, and Enoch and Methuselah, if you study all these guys' names, you find out they had godly purpose in their names and godly character in their names. I'm not going to talk about a lot of their names today, but I just want you to note something. Even in, in my Bible, when it refers to, to uh, Seth's line, it's called the family of Adam, but when it refers to Cain's line, it's referred to as the family of Cain. When Seth's line is talked about, it tells you when they were born, who their children were, and when they died. But in Cain's line, it only tells you about when they were born and who their children were. It doesn't even discuss their death. It's almost like God wasn't that concerned about them because they had chosen the direction they were going to go. It's not because God didn't love them. It's not because God couldn't save them. But there's even a term used over in the book of Jude, which is referred to as the way of Cain. Cain is the way of the world. Cain is doing things that pleases you instead of God. In fact, that very first sacrifice that he brought to, to offer God was of the, the fruits and vegetables of the ground, which God had cursed, and God couldn't accept that as, a, as an offering, a sacrifice. Whereas Abel had brought a blood sacrifice, an animal that had been taken, life was taken, given to the glory of God, which God accepted, and he didn't accept Cain's. Cain always wanted to do it his way, and his children always wanted to do it their way. In fact, the seventh from Adam on Cain's line is a, a, young, a man named Lamech. Now, Enoch was in both lines, a, a name Enoch, it was just a common name back then, and Lamech was in both lines. But one was godly, one was ungodly. Tonight we're going to look at a few of these and see why I say that, that uh, Enoch was a man who lived above the world. He didn't let the world drag him down. He didn't let the condition of the world stain him or defile him. He, he was definitely committed to God and God was committed to him. In a time like this of distress, a time when there's a lot of issues in our world, just know this, you be sold out to God, and God will be sold out to you, all right? And, and let's look at some things about this, this story today. The background of our text today that I read is this. Enoch, I call him the first space man. He was the great-grandfather of Noah. The great-grandfather of Noah. You know, uh, President Trump, uh, two or three years ago, called the president of North Korea the rocket man. Well, I guess the real rocket man was was uh, Enoch here. He was the one who left this old earth and went straight up to heaven to be with God. Enoch was also the father of Methuselah. Methuselah was the oldest man to ever live. Lived 969 years, as I said a while ago. But there's something unique about his name, which we're going to bring out. Methuselah's name meant, my grace is no more. When Noah, I mean, when Enoch named Methuselah, God told him to name him basically the end of my grace or when he dies, no more grace, judgment. Now, a lot of times we don't realize that. We don't realize that, you know, there's going to be a day here when, in, in our day and time when there's some Methuselah out there. I'm being facetious there, but there's someone out there when that last person dies, God's going to say, my grace is no more. And it's going to be a time of judgment in the world. God's done it before. And so don't think he can't do it again. On the day that Methuselah died, I, I, I didn't take the time today to do it. I've done it for our church before. But on the day Methuselah, I believe the very day, for sure the very year, but I believe the very day when Methuselah took his last breath, the rain started for the flood. I can go back and add up all these birthdays. You can do it. Go back and add up all these birthdays from Adam down through uh, Noah, and you'll find out the Bible says it was on the 600th year of Noah's life that the rains began to fall. And you can add all that up, and you know what it comes to? Guess what? 
guess how old Methuselah was when Noah was 600? He was exactly 969 years old. When Moses, I'm sorry, when Noah uh, was 600 years old and the flood started. That's just unique, isn't it? In names. Names have such power and meaning. At least they did back in those days, the Bible days. And it's like God used them to teach us something. In chapter 5, I read to you these verses in chapter 5. It's about this new godly line from Seth. This new child that took Abel's place. New child of Adam and Eve. He would be a, a man received from God, as his name means. Uh, the Bible here records the births and the deaths of Seth's line, as I said a while ago. It's amazing, conversely, that it only records the births and not the deaths of Cain's wicked lineage from chapter 4. Almost like God really didn't care. Go back and read chapter 4. You'll see where they were born, how many children they had, but it doesn't talk about their death like it does in the children of God. Even the names of Cain's line tells us something of his expectations for his children. Their names tell us a whole lot, and that's what I want to talk about, those names. First of all, the society of Enoch was a pretty rough society. It was pretty tough in that day and time. In fact, chapter 6 tells us, if you turn over to chapter 6, I'm just kind of flipping between 4, 5, and 6, but in chapter 6, in verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of, his, of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made, had made man in, on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So he said out in verse 7, it says, And I'll destroy man. Genesis 4, 16, the Bible tells us of Cain. When I say it was a rough world back then, when Cain had killed Abel and God removed him from the Garden of Eden, I want you to see in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. He left. That little phrase right there, went out from the presence of the Lord. Folks, that's a, that's a dark statement right there. And you imagine, To me, that's almost a picture of hell. That's what hell's going to be. A place where there's no presence of God. There's no grace. There's no love. There's no mercy. There's no forgiveness. Nothing good. Only that which is bad. And basically Cain left away from the presence of the Lord. Yeah, he was removed from the garden, but he still could have sought the Lord. But he lived in a land of nothing, basically. What a dark statement. As I said, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. All the promises of God. All the things that, that Cain had seen in the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine? Not even having to till the ground. Not even, plenty of food to eat. Nothing to do but lay around in the shade all day long and, and eat, eat strawberries, you know, dipped in sugar or something. But that, nothing to do but just relax in the Garden of Eden. And he, 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 God walked through that garden. And yet we see here that Cain left all of that to satisfy his own desire to be God. And uh, I wonder, I wrote on here, I wonder if he learned that from mom and dad. Well, why would you say that, Pastor? Well, they had all these blessings, and they chose to disobey God and eat from that tree, that one tree that God said don't eat from, because they wanted to be their own God. And I wonder if that's where Cain learned to be rebellious. Look at the names of Cain's kids. Remember I said they were kind of a, he was a rebellious man. Tells you in chapter 4, verse 18, that Enoch was born to Erad. Erad begot Mahuel. Mahuel, Mahuel begot Methusael. And Methusael begot Lamech. Lamech is the one who is the seventh from Adam on Cain's side. And he is one who shook his fist in the face of God and said, I don't need you and basically don't want you and not going to follow you. Erad means a fugitive or a wild donkey. That's what they named their first son. He didn't name his first son. Mahuel means smitten of God or blotting out. Methuselah means man who is of God. 
died inquiring. It means that maybe he had some knowledge of God, he, but maybe he just doubted God. He was always inquiring about God. Remember that's what the devil always wanted to do was question God, doubt God? Maybe that's what it was meaning in that name, Methuselah. And Lamech. Lamech means powerful, wild man. Can you imagine naming your child that? Now, I know in the times of Jesus and later on, it was on the eighth day that you had to name your child. The eighth day after he was born. I'm not sure when they named him back in these days. But, but Lamech was the seventh, also the seventh from Adam. What was going on? I say it was a time that was rough. It was a rough time uh, in, in, in uh, Enoch's day. So what I want you to keep in mind here now is that Enoch, this man who was so special to God that God didn't even make him die, he took him to heaven alive. If Enoch was so special to God, you might think, well, yeah, he just he was right there by the Garden of Eden. I mean, he had it easy. His daddy was Adam, you know. I mean, he had either, but I'm here to tell you he lived in a world as chaotic as our world today. Let's look at some things about this world. It was a time of moral disorder, first of all. Verse 19 uh, tells you that about that day in, in chapter 4, if you want to take your Bible and look there. When I say moral disorder, it's because uh, Lamech, it says Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Adah and the name of the other Zillah and and uh, he bore Jabel, the father of, anyway, just the different names I'll get to in just a moment. But it says, so he, he, he was the first one to practice polygamy. He was the first one to say, you remember God told him back in the Garden of Eden, he said, man, leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, you know, or, and, and those two would cleave together, that, that uh, man and woman, God created them to be man and wife, not man and wife and wife and wife and wife. And so uh, here he broke away from God's order for the home, the oldest institution on the earth, the family, the home. And, and also Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, as in the days of Noah will it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And he did not know until the flood came and took them all away so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So he says, it'll be that way in the last days before judgment, just as it was in before the first judgment, when God destroyed the earth by flood. So it was a time of moral disorder. And it didn't just, just live for God in an easy time. It was a tough time. Second thing, it was a time of modern developments. We don't think of modern developments back in that day. In fact, that's one of the reasons most people doubt whether they could actually have built an ark. I visited the ark with a group from our church here a few months back, and we went up there, and what a what an amazing thing the ark, or what it probably looked something like in their day and time. Uh, obviously, they didn't have all the tools we have today, but uh, but just the size of it, it's just it's just so massive. But but it was a time of modern developments, and you say, well, what what's modern about these cave dwellers? Almost, you know. Well, they were building cities in that day and time. That was not a a surprise. They had cities and things that they built, uh, but also some of the other modern developments of their day. Jabel, which is one of Lamech's sons, was a cattle rancher. He was into livestock and, and ranching, and he may have he may have cornered the meat market. I don't know what he did, but he he had expanded beyond living in a cave and eating lizards. Okay, uh, he had uh, Jubal. Uh, Jubal was the was into making musical instruments. He was into music and musical instruments like flutes and and uh, other types of horn. What does it say of him? Uh, uh, he, he was the father of all those who played the harp and the flute. And so as he made the musical instruments, so there was developments of their day. They didn't just walk around with a club and go ugh all the time. I mean, you know, they actually there was some culture being developed. Tubal Cain was into metalworking. Uh, the other son of, of Lamech. Uh, it tells us there that he worked with bronze and iron in verse 22. And uh, so he, he, was a, he was a metal worker. And you can imagine in that day and time, if you had the capabilities to make things out of metal, you were advanced way beyond someone else. Uh, and you could be pretty dominant in the culture. So building an ark, as I say there, would be very possible with these types of things going on in the culture. So again, I'm just saying to you that in that day and time, 
It was a time of a real progressiveness, you know. Uh, we have a lot of progressiveness today. It's not always a pretty word, but uh, uh, I wonder if some of the progressions we're making today, uh, we all use computers like right now. I wonder if, if those things will contribute to our downfall one day, you know, because we become so dependent upon them. And uh, we can get ugly things from them and not just good things. But, but let, let's look. Look at the decline of goodness that's taking place. There was a, uh, there was a decline of, of moving from the Garden of Eden to basically uh, uh, eventually the Tower of Babel after the flood where they just wanted to find their own way to God. But it was a time of malicious defiance because it tells us in verses 23 and 24 that, that Lamech went out and somebody heard him. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I've killed a man for wounding me. Even a young man for hurting me, and a cane shall be avenged sevenfold, and Lamech seventy times sevenfold. What's unique about that? First of all, a person wounded him, and he killed that person. You know, in the Bible, it says an eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth. It basically means if someone hurts you one way, their punishment can't be worse than what they did to you. Well, he did that here, but that's not my point. My point is, instead of having any grace, or any forgiveness, or any relationship... He goes straight to the shedding of blood. But also I think it's unique that verse 24 talks about Lamech said, man, if Cain, remember Cain was told if anybody killed him, they're going to get seven, they're going to have sevenfold times punishment because he wanted him to live and he wanted Cain to have it hard. Well, Lamech says that, man, if they were offering sevenfold for killing great-grandpa Cain, he said, then they're really going to be 70 times sevenfold for what I've done. Now I think that 70 verse 7 fold, times 7 fold is unique because you remember what Jesus said about that. Jesus said we're to forgive 70 times 7. And here he's saying I'm going to pay for this 70 times 7. Isn't it amazing you see the little patterns here put into scripture? Here's one whose judgment is 70 times 7 and yet Jesus talks about forgiveness 70 times 7. Let's look on. It's a stark contrast from what Jesus taught about forgiving. The second thing in the outline tonight, the mindset of God was redemption. Yeah, the world, the culture, the society of the day was definitely pretty rough. But the mindset of God, no matter how rough it gets, is always redemption. You know, God could have just said, <laughs> I don't like how none of this is turning out. I'm killing everybody. I'm wiping them out and starting over with me a new Adam and a new Eve. But he didn't, did he? Instead, the Bible tells us that he found favor in one man, in that man's family. And we know that man was Noah, don't we? The world had left God and was determined to do evil. Every man had his mind set on doing his own thing. You know, the Bible tells us further over, way further over, I think it's in Proverbs, that every man, no Psalms, that every man did what was right in his own eyes and that that there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end of that way is destruction. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it tells us, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of his thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. And how did we get from Adam to that? In a few short years, really. I mean, yeah, it's hundreds of years, but, but boy, think about that. And the Lord was sorry that he'd made man on the earth and was grieved in his heart. Man's mind was on evil. God's mind was on redemption. God's mind was on how can I, how can I correct what's gone awry? How can I bring about Jesus? How can I bring about a Savior? How can I bring about heaven, a new heaven and a new earth? Well, see, God had not left the world and was determined to do good or to bring about good in mankind. Hey, friend, I don't care what you've done. God's determined redeem you. He's determined to bring good from you if you'll let him. No matter what you've done. Genesis 5 and 6 there tells us that about how God saw what was happening and God had another plan. God had not left the world and was determined to do good. He wasn't going to give up. Genesis 6 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of of the Lord. God needed somebody to step up. He needed somebody to stand in the gap. God needed somebody 
to be a tool, a vessel that he could use to reach lost man and help him find forgiveness. And that man was Noah. As I said, a man who would bring comfort. His name meant a man who would bring comfort. Enoch's son, Methuselah, uh, was a picture of God's patient grace. As I said, he lived the longest, and God said, when he, when he dies, grace is no more. Noah's a man who found grace. Remember who Noah and Methuselah, how they're related? Methuselah is Noah's grandfather. He's Noah's grandfather. Pretty good lineage there, isn't it? Pretty good line going on for that side of the family. But they're in the vast minority. Hey, friend, if you're a Christian today, you're in the minority. I'd like to tell you, man, if you become saved, you become part of the church, ooh, everybody's going to be on your side. No, they're not. In fact, many, many, many times I stop and ponder the fact that the road to heaven is a very narrow road. If you find it, the road to hell is a broad road, and most find it. That puts us in the minority. Here's what the Bible tells us about Methuselah. He lived 969 years, and then the judgment came when he died. The mindset of God was redemption, as I said. God's always desired to save man from himself. Man's, there's a part of man that just like the old devil came to steal, kill, and destroy the devil, he creates in us a desire to self-destruct. You know, we go out, we drink all night long, and we come home and we throw up over the commode all night long, and then we wake up the next morning and say, ooh, I had fun last night, that was great. I ain't got any money, I'm sick. They got a mess to clean up this morning, but isn't life great? Isn't that wonderful? And by the way, my, my, my wife left me, and the money that I was going to put on the house payment, it ain't gone now. They're going to reclaim my house. Isn't life great? 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, you see the heart of God. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Did you know that? No matter who you are, what you've done, God wants you to be saved. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Not just some. I think even God wanted Cain to be saved. God would have desired for Cain to walk with him, but he saw his heart and he knew he didn't. It wasn't that God didn't tell him. He told him he couldn't. It's just Cain chose to go his own way. Look at some other verses about that. God has always desired to save man from himself. John 3, 16, for God so loved. I think that little two-letter word, so, right there, is one of the biggest words in the Bible. Yeah. It ought to read like S-O-O-O-O-O-O. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that term there, not perish, means not have to experience that second death in hell. That's what he's talking about. Eternal death. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You're saying today, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. Friends, none of us deserve it. I don't deserve it. But God says, if you'll say with your mouth, the word confess means to say it, to agree with God about the fact that you've sinned, and if you'll say with your mouth that you believe that Jesus, that you believe that Jesus Christ, you believe in him in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here's what I, and that word Lord means the boss. It means that you're going to confess with your mouth that you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You want to put him in charge. And you're going to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And God said, when you do that, you're saying, I believe with all my heart that Jesus died, rose from the dead, paid my sin debt. That's what that means. He paid for your sins. And my friend, if you'll claim him, if you'll, if you'll get behind him, follow him, tell him that you're sorry for your sin, the Bible says, in just a few verses down, verse 13, then whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow, that was the mindset of God way back in the book of Genesis. To provide a way of salvation. Now, this wasn't the Messiah. This wasn't the New Testament Jesus yet. But, but God, even though these people are about to die in this flood, God provided a way for them to be saved. He found a man, Noah. Let's compare these two men, Noah 
and Enoch. Let's compare them in just a moment. Uh, Enoch lived in a bad time. I I meant to put on, I think that's the one I meant to put Lamech over there on that side. But Lamech, yeah, it speaks of Lamech. The seven, both of these men are seven generations from Adam. So where I've got Enoch right there, you change that to Lamech. Seven from Adam on the bad, bad lineage. Seven from Adam on the good lineage, the good side. Lineage of Seth. Lamech lived in a bad time. He was filled with rage. His family left the faith. He found God's judgment in the flood. Now what about Noah? He lived in a bad time. He caught the attention and the love of God. Not that God didn't love Lamech. But what, got, what caught God's attention was that Noah was a man of grace. He was a man that was different from Lamech, different from the world. And so Noah's life caught the attention of God. Just like Job. Remember the story of Job? The devil tries to do things, and you know, God says, Hey, you, you leave all them folks going. But I'm telling you about Job right there. Job's caught my attention. Job was a man of God. And so that's what he's saying about Noah in his day. His family was full of faith. Well, he came up, his daddy and his granddaddy and all of them were preachers. Told people about God. And he found God's grace. One found judgment and one found grace. Number three in your outline. The grace of God brought righteousness. Genesis 5, 21-24, we read earlier today about Enoch's family. And it said of Enoch that here's this man who loved God and it said of him and he walked with God and he was not for God took him. I've always heard said Enoch and God walked together every day and one day they just got further and further away from Enoch's home and God just probably looked at Enoch and said hey Enoch we walked so far. We're closer to my house than yours. Why don't you just come on home with me? We don't know how that story went, but we do know that he walked with God. What does that mean, walk with God? He ended up walking with God meant that they spent time together. And they walked in agreement. Well, how do you know that, Pastor, how do you know that Enoch agreed with God all the time? Because of what Jesus said. Jesus said, how can two walk together lest they be agreed? Did you know that? Here's what he said right there. How can two walk together lest they be agreed? And so when I think about that, I wonder today, and I'm back up here thinking about Enoch and God walking together, what that meant was they spent time together. I'm sure that, that you know, Enoch, Enoch and God, he just heard God, he listened to God, he talked with God. And he just knew God and God knew him. I wonder today how many Christians today don't really agree with Jesus on some things. Therefore, they make room for unrighteousness in their lives. But Enoch was a man so righteous that God just took him on to heaven. So righteous because he agreed with God. God is holiness, righteousness. But there are a lot of Christians today when they don't agree with they don't agree with saying homosexuality is wrong, or they don't have a problem with abortion, or they don't have a problem with being a drunkard, or they don't have a problem with being a dope addict, or, or so many today is common don't even have a problem with, with uh, sexual immorality outside of marriage. They just say, Well, I don't care about that. I don't think God cares. You know, I'm here to tell you today you can't walk with God if you don't agree with God. And so that was that was kind of a trait, that was a characteristic of Enoch's life. Hebrews 11, 5 tells us this about Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. He was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And let me tell you something. He didn't please God if he didn't agree with God. If he was always arguing with God or disagreeing with God or defiling himself with things not of God. 
You have an underline or highlight that in your Bible of in. He pleased God. And this was a Godward testimony. This is what his testimony was to God. This is what God said. And Amina had had a funeral and God was preaching it. That's what he would have said. I am pleased with this man. You remember that's what he said about Jesus when Jesus was baptized? He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that's what God said about Enoch. Does anything to be put on my tombstone? That'd be a good thing to have on your tombstone, wouldn't it? He pleased God. Wow. He put away things that hindered his walk with God. You know, he couldn't walk with God if, if God's going down this path of righteousness and, and Enoch's over here walking down some other path. He's, he's too busy watching football. He's too busy chasing women. He's too busy getting drunk. You know, he's too busy making money. And you see, if, if Enoch's going over here doing his own thing, he's not pleasing God. He could His walk with God meant he had to get anything out of the way that hindered his relationship with God. Today we try to fit God into our old hindered life. The Bible says we've got to lay aside every weight of sin that besets us or trips us up. But we try to we try to just argue with God. Well, God, it's not too bad to be a homosexual. God says it's an abomination. Don't say it's okay when God says it's wrong. You want to argue with God and still think you're godly, but that's just not the case. Jude talks about Enoch. It says in I got first Jude, I got Jude one, probably so, but that's the only chapter. Verses 14 and 15 in the little book of Jude, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. What's he saying right there? He said Enoch had a sermon that he preached in his day, in that bad day. He had a sermon. He prophesied to the men of his day, saying, The Lord is coming with thou, ten thousands of his angels, of his saints, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them and all. What is he saying? He's basically saying, Hey guys, if you don't get right with God, he's going to judge this land. And he did, didn't he? That's what the floodwaters were. But man didn't believe it. His great grandson Noah is going to build an ark for 120 years, preaching the gospel, telling people that the rain's coming one day. Well, they didn't know what rain was, they'd never seen it. And as they get ready, and, and as he's preaching, they're hearing this message judgment's coming, rain's coming, and they're saying, He's just crazy. That's what they say about a lot of us today. It's just crazy. Well, I'm here to tell you there's a day of judgment coming. There was one in Enoch's day, and there's one coming today. And you're going to stand before God. The Bible says, appointed unto man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. And every one of us are going to give account of what we've done with our life, what we've done with Jesus. And this was Enoch's manward testimony. By that, I mean, this is the testimony of what men said about him. Men said about him. He was a preacher, a prophet, who tried to warn people about the judgment of God. Man, I don't want to hear about judgment today. In fact, a lot of Christians are looking for churches that don't preach about judgment because they want to be in a church that doesn't talk about judgment. They don't want to feel guilty about anything they've done. Yet, men spoke highly of him and his message. And last of all, the glory of God was realized. Moses said it this way when he wrote it over there in Genesis. He said, of Enoch when he disappeared, he was not. We know that Hebrews, the way it said it in Hebrews 11, was he was not found. What does that mean? It means that this great preacher had disappeared and they were looking for him. <laughs> They'd probably heard rumors of him being taken up with God. They'd heard stories but they remembered his message and now he disappeared. I'm sure just like when the church disappears one day, all the worldly people, when the rapture takes place one day, all the worldly people are going to say, good, all those judgmental Christians are gone. All those old people who are always telling us we're bad are gone. 
And we're not running around telling anybody they're bad. I saw somebody the other day, he said, y'all are all, it was, they were protesting at a convention, he said, y'all are all against us. This was, you know, homosexual groups out there protesting. I said, man, we're not against anybody. He said, oh, yes, you are. I said, no, we're not. We don't even have an official stance on the issue you're talking about, homosexuality, sodomy. He said, we don't, I, he said, y'all don't have a stance? I said, we sure don't. Now, God has a stance, and we stand with God. And if you've got an issue, you've got an issue with God. You don't have an issue with us. But one day when the church disappears, what's going to happen is the world, I think, when the church is raptured out, just like Enoch was, I think the world's going to look for us. And they're going to, eventually they're going to decide, good, all those troublemakers are gone. They may have thought about Enoch. Enoch was an old troublemaker. He was running here telling us we ought not be drinking and living immoral lifestyles and killing people. He's going to tell us. He, I'm glad he's gone. I can see some people saying, I'm glad he's gone. But they looked for him, and he was not. Same thing happened to Elijah when he was taken away. You may remember Elisha. Elisha told about, told about Elijah, because he was there with him. He said, I'm not going to leave you until you leave. And Elijah gave Elisha his mantle, and all of a sudden, the Bible says that he, the, the chariot of fire came down and took Elijah up. And, and Elisha told people about it. Told people the story. He saw it happen. Enoch was a man left behind, a, had, had left behind a redeemer type. His great grandson, Noah. Much like a redeemer, a savior. Definitely not Jesus, I'm not saying that. But he cared about men and women that were going to face the judgment. He cared about that. So much so that he spent 120 years building an ark to try to save them. A big ark. He would build an ark, the Bible says, to the saving of his people. He was, the Bible says in Hebrews, he was moved by fear, built an ark to the saving of his family. But I'm here to tell you, he built that ark for anybody who believed and get on. I'm here to tell you today, there's an ark today, and that ark is Jesus. Enoch wasn't the redeemer. But he helped provide one, just like Noah wasn't the redeemer, but he provided one, the saving ark. Three times, three types of arks are talked about in the Bible. This ark, which, which I, I love talking about this ark because it's unique in the sense, and we're just about through here, but it was unique in the sense when God, when God told him to get in it, he said, come in. He didn't say go in. He said come in. Anybody you know tells me? God's already in the ark. <laughs> that ark wasn't going down. Well, they were going to take God down in that storm. This ark only had one door. There's only one door to the Father. And Jesus said, I'm that door. If you come to the Father, you come through me. If you study about the ark, how it was made, there was, once it was made with gopher wood, the, the, the cracks between the logs were sealed with something called pitch. It's a lot like tar. But if you study that word pitch, it's the same Hebrew word for the word atonement. What helped keep that, what helped redeem and save Noah and his family, that, that eight people, was the atonement. It kept the water, the judgment out. The atonement. Man, that's, that's an Old Testament word that talks about what Jesus did on the cross. The only, that to get in that ark, they had to have faith. That they weren't going to get out there, be locked in, and sink. And the only thing that was going to keep the judgment water out was the atonement. Wow. You ought to said wow right there if you didn't. And so, so Jesus was a, much like this ark. But did you know something else? Jesus, Jesus was like all the arks. They said that was a little ark that maybe, maybe Moses was saved in. A little brush little ark. And God put him in there to save him. That he might deliver his people. So Jesus was a type of saving ark for him. Then there's the ark of the covenant in the Bible. On the top of the ark of the covenant is the mercy seat. Between two big cherubim angels and, and, and on, on that ark, people can find something. When blood is put on there, they can find the mercy of God. 
That ark's a type of Jesus. For his blood will provide for you mercy. You see, friends, the Bible's put together a certain way for a certain reason. That you might understand that every one of us needs an ark. Every one of us needs a way out. Every one of us needs saving. Every one of us needs a redeemer. And every time the Bible talks about an ark, it's talking about a redeemer, a savior, a deliverer. That's who Jesus is. But talking about Enoch today and his family, I want to ask you a couple of questions before we close. Enoch, he parented, I like this, he, he parented for the ark. He lived his life, he raised his family in such a way that, that God had somebody to turn to when he needed a redeeming family. Wow. Would that be said of our families? Methuselah, Enoch's son, preached the grace of the ark. He preached about the grace. His life was about the grace. And the moment he died... The ark was needed because the rain started. Methuselah's life preached the grace of God that will one day end. Methuselah had a grandson named Noah. And he prepared that ark of salvation. Noah. Noah. Bible says in Hebrews, Noah put his faith to work. There's a lot of folks today say they got faith, but they're not preparing nothing. They're not, it's not changing to what they do. You see, Noah's faith changed what he did. He didn't just say, yeah, it's going to rain one day. No, he got out there and sweated for 120 years and made a, a way of salvation. Now, he wasn't the salvation but he helped promote the way of salvation. So his faith moved him to prepare an ark. You see this. Jesus is providing God's ark of redemption. He's the only door. He's the only way in. There is no other way. Have you walked through that door? Are you willing to walk through it? Jesus says, I'm the door to the Father. Enter through me. There's no other way, he said, than that way. Isn't it neat that we could look at Genesis chapters 5, and it ties in with the New Testament? Isn't it neat that we see that whatever depths of sin and worldliness we're in. God's reaching out to us with an ark. A, a, a way to get us out. A door that we could go through. And that's Jesus Christ. Friend, I pray you've been through that door. And I pray that you're safe inside the ark of God's salvation. Jesus Christ. If you have questions... If you would like to pray right now to receive Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. To take away your fears, if you just trust Him. To take away your sins, if you'll just ask Him. But you commit yourself to follow Him. You say, Pastor, I don't know what to pray. You can pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Jesus, just pray it where you are. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. And I know Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. Lord, come into my life. I place my faith in you. I'm going to follow you. And God, I'm asking you to forgive my sins. Save me. I believe you died on the cross for me. And rose from the dead for me. Thank you, Jesus. For loving me, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
hey, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to ask you to, to uh, send an email to our church. It's office at washingtonbaptist.org. Or you can send me a text message on my phone. You can call, you, or, or, or later call me when I finish here. But 318-278-2712. reason I ask you to send us an email or, or make a call at the church, 387-6372. We're not there. Leave a message on the answer machine. Tell us that you prayed that prayer with the pastor. We'd like to send you some free information. There's things that you need to do now. Give you some devotional things to read, and uh, and ask you to find a church. It doesn't have to be our church. Bible believing, Bible teaching church. Go there. Get involved. Learn how now to live for Christ. I pray that tonight's lesson spoke to you. We live in a day that's a very dangerous day, a very rough day. But know this, while you're thinking about how tough it is, God's thinking about how he's going to get you out of that. And he's reaching out to you if you let him. He's offering you his salvation. Thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you.